Hello, Lori, can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Yay, Dr. Profeta. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, Lori, I'm okay. doing great. How are you? I just want to tell the, everybody watching, I'm in Jerusalem and Dr. Profeta in my home and Dr. Profeta is in his home in Indianapolis. So th thanks to the magic of Zoom and Facebook Live. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Profeta. So I, I just want to tell everybody, I know Dr. Profeta because his wife came on a momentum trip and then his sister-in-law came on a momentum trip and then he and his brother-in-law came on, was it the first men's trip you came on? It was the very first men's trip. It was fantastic. It was an amazing experience. Wow, wow. Okay, now Dr. Profeta, please, as a doctor, please update us on the current situation that you and your colleagues are facing. Have you seen a change since the pandemic began? Yeah, at the very beginning, I mean, we were seeing a ton of COVID cases. They're certainly decreasing right now. Um, I, I can't tell you if that's all because of social distancing or whether it's just a change in the environment, um, whether this virus just isn't doing as well in the spring months as it, as it was earlier on. Um, but we're certainly seeing a, a decrease in the amount of, amount of cases. We got a little bump after um, Easter, I think, when people were congregating uh, more during that uh, holiday time and Passover. Uh, but it's, it seems to be decreasing. I worked the other day, I saw four cases, one critically ill. Um, but we're still right in the midst of it. Um, we're still taking all the precautions and it's still a very emotionally charged environment right now. Can I ask you, people are saying like, oh yes, like you're saying when the spring comes or warm weather, but you, you see it happening in Florida when there's warm weather all the time. So could you explain that to me? Well, you know, you bring up, you bring up a very good point. Um, I would have thought that we would have had a lot more cases in Florida and Texas. Um, I mean, certainly they're seeing a ton of them, but with those population centers, I was really worried that we were going to see what we were seeing in New York, uh, New York City. Um, I don't have, we don't have all the answers. We just don't know. I mean, this is such a novel virus. It hasn't really been in the human population before. It's behaving like, unlike any illness I have ever seen in my 25 years. Uh, years of doing this, which is why it's su such an emotionally charged environment. I mean, a few weeks ago, uh, we were terrified. Uh, you know, we were terrified to go to work, and we still are, um, because you know we're seeing you know people in their fifties and sixties dying from this. Fortunately, we're not seeing um, the catastrophic impact on the younger population. I I think I've only seen one pediatric case uh, myself so far. Um, we're certainly seeing them, but it does, it's not having an impact in that community as much as it is in the elderly population and those at risk. So can you tell me, I, like I've see, read some incredible stories. First of all, people, we are so in awe and so thankful for all the courageous healthcare professionals and the, and the first responders. And I've, I've read stories where, where, where doctors are sleeping in their cars because they're afraid to come back into the house and they can't hug their children. How are you personally impacted and your family? Well, I mean, you know, my family has, has sort of weathered the storm pretty well. I mean, we are taking an unbelievable amount of precautions. And I've made some jokes about this, you know, having to undress in the garage and uh, soak my clothes in, in pine saw. I don't allow anybody else in my truck. We uh, spray down, I spray down the truck after every shift, um, wipe down every single possible surface. I'm wearing a, a mask uh, the entire time at work. I'm wearing uh, face shields, goggles, um, gown, gloving. Um, and it, it, it's an extremely emotionally exhausting experience. You know, um, we have partners in my group who have children who are at risk, have other family members that are living with them. Some of them are self-isolating in basements, at uh, apartments, at hotels while they work. And, you know, at, at the beginning, we were, I think, really concerned that we were going to lose a lot of doctors and nurses, and maybe even have some of them die um, from this illness. So it was incredibly terrifying at the, at the very beginning. But fortunately, you know, we haven't been seeing that. And I don't know if it's because the population is, is healthier. I mean, certainly a lot of our, some of our nurses um, and other personnel got sick. But um, fortunately, we haven't um, experienced that um, to any you know, significant degree. And it may be because we have, we're so cautious in, in the ER when we're working on how we're, everything we're touching, how we're cleaning ourselves, how we're wearing masks and protective gear. So, Wow, wow. It's wow. exhausting emotionally. Uh, it's incredibly emotionally taxing. Wow. So Dr. Profeta, 
something very special happened when I reached out to you when this first began, because things were very intense when it first began. And you told me at one point, you said, Laurie, I'm scared. I'm scared. And we talked about doing an initiative together, uh, which, which became Care with a Prayer, which we're going to talk about. Um, and so maybe you could share that story with, uh, with everybody watching. Well, in the in the early in the early days of this, when we were in the in the emergency department, it it was absolutely terrifying. I mean, um, you know, I didn't know if these were you know, and I think I told you I didn't know if this was the last day I would leave work or leave to go to work, and I'd say to my wife and my kids, I don't know if this is going to be the last day I'm ever healthy, and um, you know, is today the day I get sick? Is today the day I get? Um, COVID and die. I mean, these are real things. I mean, I had made phone calls to my finance guy, you know, you know, the other friends to, you know, help them in terms of taking care of my wife and my kids. Should I, you know, die from this illness, uh, you know, made, you know, uh, talked about those issues, where my passcodes are to my computer, all the things that you need to know. Um, and so that was what all of us were facing, going to work. But, but you know, it wasn't an option not to go to work. You, you still had to go and had to, had to take care of these patients. And, you know, I, I was telling you, you had reached out to me, I think, and, you know, said, hey, you were thinking of me. Um, and my partner, Jamie Harper, who also was on the women's trip, too, uh, who's an ER doc. And, you know, we said, you know, there's not a lot. You know, you said, what, what can I do? I said, you can pray. I mean, that's the only thing, you know. All my friends were like, what can we do? And I said, the only thing really that you have, have we can offer me is, is prayer. I hope this goes well. And you said that you were davening for me. You asked me for my, uh, I think my mother, my father's um, Hebrew names, my Hebrew name. And, and I remember that evening going into a, a patient's room and um, uh, an older gentleman, and he was horribly ill. And it was clear he had COVID and complications from it and probably was going to end up dying from it. And I remember thinking to myself, wonder who's davening for this poor guy, you know, because his family couldn't even, you know, most of these family members can't even come in with um, their, they can't, they, they're kept out. So these people were dying alone. These people were experiencing the most terrifying moments of their lives by themselves. And it was incredibly humbling, horrible experience. Um, and it still is to, to, to witness that. And, you know, we have pastoral care, you know, we're a, a Ascension Hospital, we have pastoral care, we'll come in, and they'll say, you know, Dr. Prophet, anything I can do for you today? And we just go, yeah, you can say a prayer for us. And it's amazing it, how it lifts them up. It lifts pastoral care up. You know, maybe it's not my God, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity, you know, uh, person when it comes to that. And it's funny because I've had other friends, too, that have reached out in sort of in, in the Christian community and said, hey, what can we do? And I said, just pray. And, and some of them, uh, one of my friends, Linda, uh, started a prayer group for healthcare providers in the, in the city also. And, um, you know, it's been incredibly humbling for you to sort of do this initiative care with a prayer. And um, I actually wrote about a prayer, an article about prayer in the time of COVID. So it's been an incredibly uh, um, spiritual experience too. Can I ask you, doctor, when you were growing up, you know, like you grew up Jewish, like I did, not so necessarily so observant, how did you relate to prayer then? And, and what, how did things change for you? Well, I, I, Laura, you know that my, my um, going to Israel um, with the men's trip was an incredibly um, awakening experience for me. And then after that time, my son, my oldest boy, developed leukemia and was horribly ill. And obviously prayer pay, played a much bigger role during his time in the hospital. Um, and How old I've, was your I've tried, he was 21 when he, when he became ill. And um, I made some friendships uh, on that men's trip that helped support me during that time through his illness, which, and which um, I'm so indebted to the rest of my life, but the sort of that spiritual connection to God and prayer during the time of his illness. I remember his um, oncologist, um, Dr. Steinhertz, one of the first things he asked me was, what is my son's Hebrew name? Um, when we went in, was diagnosed, and he would pray for my son every day. Wow. And so 
those kind of prayers and those prayers that we're getting from the people in the community during this um, horrible time for us as healthcare providers, sometimes that's all you can do for us, all you can do to help us. That and send a pizza or two to the ER. Um, but I mean, I think it's working. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, Listen, I feel better. I think things are better. Do you have a picture of your son or your boys? I know you have three boys. I've got three boys. Um, show. Well, that. That's them, and they're all single. <laughs> oh, my God. That's Max, Max, e, Max Eli, and Zachary. How old are yeah. they? <laughs> they're 26, are they? uh, 20, 26, 24, and 22. Okay. Are they going to kill you for, for making showing everybody that they're single and handsome and, and available? Well, they're here in the room. You guys going to kill me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, but it's okay, great. Ha so it's it's great and horrible having them back uh, at the same time. Obviously, they're here sheltering with us for this wow. pandemic. Hopefully, we can get them back to work. Okay, so everybody out there, if you've got uh, if you've got some daughters, <laughs> you've got some nice single daughters, nice Jewish daughters. <laughs> maybe maybe some we can have a a very a great follow up story for this. Okay, so when I reached out to Dr. Profeta, so I want you to everybody to know that uh, we've known each other for years. And when, and he's, he, he's a little bit of a tough guy, he's a strong guy. He, he often speaks on campuses. Uh, he speaks to fraternities and to a lot of the college kids. Could you maybe you explain why you do that at the beginning of the years? Well, I, I go around college campuses and I have a, a, a talk about um, sex, drugs, drinking, and dying with the frat boys, where we talk about sort of the issues, the social issues involving fraternities and sororities on college campuses, um, especially when it comes to drug and alcohol abuse and hazing on college campuses. I had written an article on LinkedIn about it some years ago that blew up. And yeah, now I, I get, people, I get how asked. Many watch, how many people read that article? Tell them. That article is probably read, uh, I think, 2.5 million times on LinkedIn alone. I think my articles last year were read around 20 million times on LinkedIn. I wrote one called, I'll look at your Facebook profile before I tell your mother you're dead. Again, these are about, these are issues talking candidly with college students and younger people about the risk taking behavior and sort of the devastation they leave in their wake. And that's sort of been, I guess, my niche in, in sort of the secondary, I don't want to call it a career, but sort of, um, um, you know, mission of mine in life in, in order to go to college campuses and keep from having to tell parents their kids have been killed. So it's been an incredibly emotional journey and, I, and one that I loved. I had a whole bunch of gigs set up prior to um, this whole pandemic, but it is what it is. It you is go the way God sends you. Yeah. So listen, I, uh, so when I, when, I, when I reached out to Dr. Rafetta and he told me, because uh, he told me that he's scared. He was Lori, I'm scared. I really shook me because he is such a strong, tough guy. And I, there is something called, um, it, like it really came, it came to me that, that there was something, an initiative uh, a few years ago in Israel called the Shomrim Project. And what it did was, it was a, a, a website where you could go on during the war and you put in your email and they send you the name, the, the name, the Jewish name of a soldier and his mother's name, and that's how we pray. Uh, and, that, and that soldier was in my prayers every day. So this soldier I knew, I, I didn't know anything about him, except I figured out like a little sleuthing, you know, if you think about it, his mother's name was like Svetlana or something. It was clear that he was Russian. So I figured maybe he's a lone soldier here. So that soldier, I put his name on our fridge and our whole family, we were praying for that soldier every day. And there's some beautiful stories that came out of this project. There was a woman who two year, um, like about two years after the, the, the war was over, from America, came to Israel, was traveling, was in the north, was in a cafe, and she struck up a conversation with her waiter. And the waiter said that he had, you know, in the conversation said that he had served in that war. And she goes, oh, I was praying for a soldier in that war. And she said his name, and it was him. It was her waiter. Unbelievable. Yeah, amazing. So the idea, when I was speaking to Dr. Profeta, the idea was, let's set up something. Who are the soldiers today? It's Dr. Profeta and the nurses and the orderlies and the EMTs and the, and the, the police and the fire. All these people are the soldiers on the front line. 
Now, with Dr. Profeta, you, you, you kind of like squeezed over it a little bit, you, you smushed over it a little bit, that it's really true that when he goes home, he does not walk into his house. He goes into the garage, right? You, you he takes off all his yeah. clothes and he pours like, what, what, what do you do? How do you disinfect your shoes? Yeah, pine salt or yeah, Lysol spray and pine salt and I, I soak everything. And then they, you know, they leave the doors open and I run upstairs, you know, with the shower on already and, and try to not to touch yeah. anything in the house. So he's streaking in his house and he's showering down. Yeah, pretty because, much. Because we go out and I, like my husband is high risk because he had cardiac issues years ago. I had reached out to Dr. Perfetto when that happened and of his age. And so when I even take out the garbage, I wear gloves, I wear a mask and I come back and I wash my hands. And if I have to go out and do something else, which I really have done maybe twice in eight weeks, I come also and like you, like, you know, and you just make sure that you're, you're trying to protect the people in your house. So, so the idea was to create this. So we have a site, we have a site. Um, it's called Care With A Prayer that we created, our team created. It's about, it's gone live. In the first four hours, a thousand names went in. A thousand names went in, amazing. And, and um, we had, there you are, everybody can see it. So, uh, you, so right now we have about 1700 names in the system of, of healthcare workers. So you can go in and put in more names. But we are, we're asking everybody out there to go in and also take names. Please take names. So right now we have about over 1,700 people who, uh, who have put in, we have names in the system. And just over 600 people have taken names. So over 1,000 people still need somebody to pray for them. Now I'm, I'm going to ask everybody, not only that you should go in, so don't just have one care, healthcare worker for your family. Get every one of your children to take a name every one of your children. Why? Because there's so many people who have told me, some of their kids are like, they're bored, they're climbing the walls, they're like, they're just, or if you happen to have a pool and you're living in Florida, they're swimming every day, very nice. <laughs> but there's something heavy going on in the world. There's something heavy going on in the world. And I think this is a very meaningful way that your kids can connect and they can have their own name of who that person is. I'm, I'm praying for, she's, um, she's a, a nurse practitioner and her name is Barbara, Barbara Gella. And, and I pray for her every day and she should be well. I don't know anything about her. And I put it on my Facebook. I said, I don't know who you are, but I just want you to know you are in my prayers. And we made a universal prayer that people can say, uh, or you can just you speak from your heart, whatever it is and you can pray. So we're about to, right now it's in English, and we're going to be launching, uh, I believe by the end of this week, hopefully, in Hebrew, Russian, Arabic, and Spanish. Now I want you to know why we do it in Arabic. Not only are there many countries out there who are going through this, but in Israel, it's known that in the hospitals, like I've been in Hadassah Hospital, and there are Arab doctors and, and uh, Jewish doctors are working side by side. The same with, you know, it, uh, Mug and David Adom in the ambulance service. Everybody's in this together. And I don't know, I, I don't know about you, Dr. Profeta, but I grew up in Canada and was like, you know what? Like, I just really related to being Canadian and we're sorry for everything and all the things with Canadians and nice and polite. And then I came to Israel for the first time as a young adult and I really started relating to like, wow, I'm part of the Jewish people. And since this began, I feel connected to every person in the world because we're all going through this together. It really is incredible. Do you, have you seen uh, in terms of the team of, of everybody coming together in your hospital? And also, I know you're connected to medical people all over the world. What are you hearing from them? Well, I mean, everybody's going through the same thing. I mean, the, the amount, the volume of patients may be different from community to, to community, but it's amazing how it takes something like uh, a virus for us to all realize we, we have the same beating hearts, the same circulating blood, we breathe the same air, we have the same lungs, you know. This thing does not care if you're black or white or Jewish or Christian or Muslim, it does not care. It is an equal opportunity pathogen. Um, it may go after certain people for certain risk factors, but that's about it. Um, it just does not care. And, you know, it's, it's this kind of environment or this kind of situation that we have to come together as a, as a human race and tackle this. And, you know, it is the biggest threat to our planet right now. Um, it also, I think, it's interesting how it has unified so many families because we have 
we've gotten away from a lot of the stuff that we thought were important in our lives um, and how it makes you, it takes something like this to, to sort of downsize your concerns. You realize there's not a whole lot you really should be worried about in this world other than your health and your well-being. And it, it shows you how just incredibly small so many of the problems and so many of the issues in society we thought were important really are not that important. And if we can get through this, we can get through anything. And I would like to see us more from a geopolitical standpoint, just to be more unified in terms of how our discourse, because there's nobody in this country that wants uh, people to suffer, or you know, we may have different opinions on how we get to these solutions, but we're all, we're all in it together, and we all want everybody to be healthy for the most part. Beautiful. Can you give us maybe a couple of tips? Um, because I've, people are starting to get a little bit relaxed, like a little bit like, oh, I guess we flattened the curve. And there are people still dying every day. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned, I'm sure you are, about that. And also, can you also speak to the, the issue of there are people are afraid to go to the doctor or the hospital now because they're afraid of getting it, and, but they have other illnesses? You, know, you bring up a great point, Lori, and there is no easy answer. Um, if we go out too early, uh, people are going to die. But if we stay in, people are also going to die. Um, nobody really knows the math. Um, I have no doubt that countless thousands of, of our, our fellow Americans have died because they, not because of COVID, because of fear of not going to the hospital. And that means people that weren't going to get their chemotherapy, that weren't getting their uh, cancer screening exams, people that were having heart attacks that were dying at home that we would have been able to save at home, people with strokes, sepsis, uh, uh, abscesses in their abdomen, perforated appendix, a whole host of illnesses that we should have seen earlier that we may have been able to say that that did not come to the hospital. It is safe to come to the hospital. Um, you know, we may keep your family members out just so they're not exposed, but what, we will keep you safe. We will keep you masked. We're wearing masks and gowns. We're, you know, so if, if, if you have health issues like that, you've got to come in. I don't have an answer. Nobody really knows when the best time to open the society up is, when the best time to close it. I would, I would tell you this, though. If I had risk factors, I would not be out in public. And things like uh, morbid obesity, hypertension, diabetes, congestive heart failure, transplant patients, cancer patients, I would not be out in a million years. And that also means you probably shouldn't be visiting those patients. Um, you know, is it safe to go out? Nobody really knows the answer to that, Lori. We don't even know if the antibody or your exposure gives you immunity from this. So the science is still fluid. Um, it would have been nice if we had, as a country, known about this a month earlier, had a better uh, uh, jump on it. Um, but the situation is still fluid. It doesn't mean that we, that we don't paint the entire country with one paintbrush. There's certain states that probably be, be safer to go out because of population densities and things like that. Other states that are gonna be higher risks uh, once they op open the doors to everything. And we have to be cognizant that that is a real risk. Uh, and until we have good drugs, until we have a vaccine, this is gonna be the new normal in this world. We're gonna have a world pre-COVID and a world post-COVID. And we just have to go with the flow and address it like that. I hope everybody's listening to Dr. Perfetta, okay? Because just because your governor or your state legislator or the president says something, if you're in high risk, like, don't go out. Don't go out. Just because they said you could go out, there's a lot of politics going on behind the scenes. And, and if you are a high risk person that Dr. Perfetta talked about, don't go out. Just because they tell you you could go out doesn't mean you should go out. Is this correct, Dr. Perfetta? Yeah, and I think that one of the things that I would tell people to pay attention to is to pay attention to countries in the Southern Hemisphere, things like uh, places like Australia and New Zealand that are going into their fall months right now, because that'll be a good indicator of what our fall will look like, because this should resurge, uh, have a resurgence of it, in, in, especially in the fall. Um, and it may all of a sudden, you know, you, people will point to Sweden, they'll say, well, you know, they didn't shut down. Well, you know, Sweden has... Um, their death rate is actually exceeds ours in terms of, you know, their per capita, the number of patient, uh, people in that country. Um, so there, there is a fine balance between how, how much restrictions you put on and how little. But if, again, it is a fluid situation. We don't know how it reacts with the environment. There's a whole host of unknowns. 
and you still need to be cautious. And I think that we will see a, a bump again in um, in the fall. I am hopeful. Oh, we just lost your, we just lost your, uh, we can't hear you. We lost your volume. There are some new treatment modalities that are coming out. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, and, no, um, we, we just have to, we have to wait and see. Um, I mean, there are some antiviral medicines that are looking promising, but they aren't for the general use out in the outpatient community. So we need a vaccine. Hopefully we can get one by the fall. Okay. And fast track it. Uh, I have to tell you, my husband is not leaving this house until there's a vaccine because he's high risk. <laughs> And that could be a while. So it's a good thing we like our home and it's a good thing we like each other. That's mm -hmm. all I can say. Dr. Profeta, this has been really, really, really tremendous. I, we cannot thank you enough for your time. Can you just tell us a little bit, I'm a little bit curious about your hat, but it says Door 5 family, oh, what's that? Door 5 is the, ent door five is the entrance to our emergency department at, at St. Vincent's Hospital. So most of the doctors and nurses, our techs, um, therapists have these hats to indicate that we're one family. And uh, we're all in the same fight together. And Lori, I have to compliment you on the on the the what you have done in this community is just uh, it's unbelievable. It you know just the creativity that you have to do something like this to take this initiative on your shoulders is uh, to be applauded. And uh, you know more people need to do this. There's always solutions. There's always something that you can do. And we're only limited by our imagination and what you've done with Momentum and JWRP beforehand and uh, the men's trip, uh, you and Charlie Harari too. I, uh, Charlie's story, his basketball story is phenomenal. I, yeah. It is one of the, the pure gems that has appeared on social media. If you haven't had an opportunity, make sure you watch it, uh, wow. dealing with issues like this. Um, but what you've done is incredible and uh, what people have done in my community in terms of supporting our ER, providing food, just, it's, it's amazing. We just need to keep doing it. We, we, you are our heroes. I really mean it. You and your team and care with a prayer. I, I it's, it's really, it's such a special, special project to have, and it, and it came because of our friendship it means so, so much to me. So just to remind everybody, carewithaprayer.org, put in names, take out names and share, share, share. And please, God, you should be safe. Dr. Profeta, you are in my prayers. Do not worry. And I'm here in Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank so I'm, you. At, I'm, I'm here in the center. I, it doesn't You're get ground it. zero. This, this is a direct, it's a direct call here, okay? So please, you and your family should be well, and we should get your sons married and everything good. So I really, really <laughs> thank you so, so much for joining us today.